So I am very pleased this evening to present David Miller. Thank you, Michael. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about what life was like in Rhinebeck in the early 1900s. And I'm going to do it by showing 100 historical postcards that'll really let you see what Rhinebeck looked like 100 years ago. So a quick two minute synopsis of the invention of the postcards. Um, 1861, Congress passed an act that allowed for the printing of private postcards. It didn't really take off until the Columbia Exposition in Chicago in 1893, when postcards were given out to the participants of all of the buildings at the fair. And the first two decades of the 20th century were the heyday of postcards. Um, until 1907, you were only allowed to write a message on the front of the postcard. And you'll see a lot of postcards with messages written on the front instead of what we have today, which was called the divided back, where there's a message on the left and the, and the address and the stamp on the right. And that was passed by the Congress in 1907. So several years ago, Scott Cruikshank showed me his fabulous collection of 450 postcards of Rhinebeck. And I asked him if I could scan them. He said, yes. And I scanned them all. And it was 900 scans because I scanned the backs as well. And you'll see some of the backs. And I'm going to show you what life was like. So Scott had his postcards organized into groups like trains, houses, churches. And I'm going to follow his talk as we move through the collection. So let me start by sharing the screen and starting my PowerPoint and life in Rhinebeck in the early 1900s. Here's the very first postcard. It's of the Rhinecliff train station around um, 1908. And it says, excuse me for, for not writing before, you know what? Hard work moving means love, Anna. So again, you couldn't write on the back, even though this was in 1908, they still had a lot of old postcards left without the divided back. And so um, this was what the postcard looked like. People waiting for the train. Here's the back of the postcard, 1908. Mrs. George Brook, Statsburg, New York. This side is for address only. Statsburg, you didn't need, there weren't a lot of people in, in Dutchess County, 100 years ago, you could just say David Miller, Rhinebeck, and the mail would get to me. If you put down my street, you didn't even need a number because there, all the villages and towns were quite small. Here's another example of a postcard from 1915 showing you the divider back. Hello, mother, I'm having a fine time. To Mother Miller, this is mailed in 1915, Cumberland Street, Brooklyn. So you can see most of the messages I thought would be fabulous. They give me the whole history of Rhinebeck, but they didn't. Mostly it says, having a wonderful time. See you when we get back to the city. The weather's good. It's great to be up here in the country. Here's another picture of the Rhinecliff train station. It's a wider shot showing the cliffs above the station. All these houses are still quite there. There are four tracks in those days because two of them were for the Rhinebeck Connecticut Railroad. I continued down the tracks and up where today's water treatment plant is, up through Hogs Bridge and Red Hook and on out to Connecticut. There's another colorized postcard. Um, and I love it. It says 89.1 miles from New York, 350.9 miles to Buffalo. Okay. So this, we have a new, more modern road going up over the train tracks, but the ferry used to go here until 1957 when the bridge was built from Rhinebeck to Kingston across the river. Here's a postcard from 1915. We are certainly having a great trip, Mrs. McCumber, to Mr. Mrs. Seymour and Darien, Connecticut. So what's this up here? This is 1915, a swastika. What does that mean? Well, doing some research with Michael, um, the word swastika comes from a Sanskrit word which means good fortune or well-being. It appears to have first been used in Eurasia as early as 7,000 years ago. 
And to this day, it's still a symbol of Hinduism, Buddhism, and other religions. It's common site on temples or houses in India or Indonesia, and it's been found on ancient buildings in Europe. It is unfortunate that such a beautiful symbol of peace and good fortune was used for such an evil purpose 20 years later. Here's the first picture of the village. It's the Springbrook House, built in 1800. It was a farm located across from today's fairgrounds between the hospital and Kramer Road. It was obviously torn down at some time to build the buildings that are there today. Here's a very old image um, of Platt Avenue from around 1900. Looking up Platt Avenue, these buildings are all still here. We're looking towards Route 9. And this, I believe, is the Haven Spa today. This is a picture up 308 of Dr. George Miller's residence, which was Schuyler House. Philip Schuyler lived there at one point as well. And here is Miller's Bridge, which is just across the road from it. And the Rhinebeck Kill, Landsman's Kill goes under it. And here's another picture of it, the falls on Landsman's Kill at the Miller Estate. And Marilyn Hatch and I had a program about the mills of Landsman's Kill. And we found a foundation here and a foundation down here towards the bridge of the Rutzen Sawmill and uh, the Schuyler Grist Mill. These are two pictures of Warren Delano's house and the gatehouse I'll show you in a second, known as Steen Vallegi or Mandera. This is currently called Stone Valley in the town of Red Hook. And here's a picture of the beautiful gatehouse. This is on, this is Conrad Stein's house. It's on the river. It was called Whispering Pines and it's between South Mill Road and the Hudson River. Conrad Stein stayed there only in the summers during the first decade of the 20th century. Like his neighbor, Jacob Rupert, who I'll talk about in a few minutes. He was a New York City beer baron. Rupert donated his property to Linwood to the Sisters of St. Ursula but Stein Estate is still in private hands, and I got the whole history of it thanks to one of our volunteers, Herman Tejan. Here are some pictures of Southlands. This was Glenburn. It was Deb Dow's house. They kept their archives in it. It burned down some years ago, and we have the remnants of the archives, which volunteers are attempting to restore to get the history of, of uh, Southlands back into our archives. The next four cards are from the Astor Estate. This is the conservatory at Ferncliff. Unfortunately, that's gone. This is the Stone Barns. This was, is or was, I'm not sure if she still owns it, Annie Leibowitz's house, and this is still there intact. This, unfortunately, is the Astor Mansion, and I've been told that it was demoed by Vincent Astor's second wife because she did not want to live in a house that was built by the first wife. And here, of course, is Astor Quartz, which is still here today. And after the mansion was demolished, they split their time between uh, the tennis courts, which we know was Astor Quartz, and the tea house, which is right over here behind these trees. Here's a great picture of the Dutchess County Fair in 1908. Now, I gave a, a, a talk about this some, some time ago. The fair moved in 1888 from Washington Hollow, which is out on Route 44 near the State Trooper Barracks, to Hudson River Driving Park, just southwest of Vassar College. It was there in, until 1919 when it was moved to Rhinebeck. So we have very few pictures of the fair at uh, the Hudson River Driving Park location, and it's great that we have it in the, in the collection. Here, of course, is a more modern picture of the fair in Rhinebeck. You can still see some of the 400 greenhouses that were here in 1900. This picture is probably from 1940 or 50. Here is the track where horses and trotters raced. Here are the tracks where stock cars and midget cars raced. I wish we had 
all of those today, but we don't have any car racing or horse racing at the fair anymore. Here is um, the uh, a picture of Thompson House, Rhinebeck's first hospital at 23 Livingston Street. It was built in 1843 as the parsonage for the nearby Lutheran Church, which was converted to a hospital in 1903. Today, it's a multifamily house that still looks very much like this. And uh, at it, it moved in 1919 from the Thompson House when the first version of the Duchess Health Center was built. And of course, Northern Duchess Hospital is way, way bigger than this. It is nothing like two cars in the parking lot. Today, we have room for hundreds of cars in expanded hospital, and you cannot find a parking spot. Here's another picture. This is a very old version of the Beekman Arms. This picture is from very early 1900. The post office was here. This is one of three locations uh, where the post office was located. It was also Rhinebeck Hall, where the Rhinebeck government met, and a pharmacy was in here. This building was torn down by FDR in the 1930s, and he built the current FDR post office that we have today. Beautiful building, a shame it's torn down. These are some greenhouses on Violet Avenue, part of Rhinebeck's 400 greenhouses at the turn of the century. Here's a picture of the inside of a greenhouse. It looks quite lovely to be working uh, inside of a greenhouse, weeding and fertilizing the plants. But I was told by Herman Tijan and, and several others that the village didn't have a lot of money. And so they used to fertilize the, the violets, waste from the various outhouses in the village to fertilize the greenhouses. So it looks beautiful, but it was not a very pleasant place to work. And of course, many of you have seen this postcard from early 1900. It was shipping these violets by horseback down the river road to the train tracks to ship them to the city. Millions were shipped on things like Mother's Day and other and Easter. This, of course, is the Star Institute, which still is here today. It housed the YMCA. It was a swimming pool, a basketball court, a bowling alley in the basement, and of course, um, the library. I mean, today I believe this is a rest. This is a real estate office. This is a restaurant. The stores in here have changed many, many times, even in my short twenty years here. And the library was in there. It is a very early postcard of what it was like inside the Rhinebeck Library at the Star Building. Before decades later, the new Star Library was built up the hill at Thompson Mazzarella Park. This is Holiday Farm for Convalescent Children, built in 1802. It was built, is a 1908 postcard. It was built um, down in Rhinecliffe by Alice Morton, Vice President Morton's daughter. Decades later, Vincent Astor built this building up on Route 9, which we know in the village. It too has been expanded many times. And uh, he hired McKim, Mead, and White, famous architect, to build it. And he named the building after his father, John Jacob Astor. So this is Astor Home, still a home for children. This is a very old postcard. This is also post office in Western Union was in this building. Of course, today, this is Gigi's. It was a Ford dealer, a Chevy dealer. I have pictures from the 1940s when it was a gas station. And I have pictures from 1945 when this building was torn down. Frank Asher took pictures of it being torn down. And today, of course, it's the parking lot for Gigi's. A great loss. It was a beautiful building. Mm. This is a very unique postcard. This is a picture at Hogs Bridge at the bottom of Montgomery Street from the hospital. And this is Duchess Heat, Light, and Power, which was built in 1900 and was Rhinebeck's first electric power plant. And these buildings all around it would allow coal company and other businesses because the Rhinebeck Connecticut Railroad stopped somewhere in here and picked up coal and other products and continued on to Connecticut with them. Today's is a private home. The windows have been expanded. 
All these buildings are gone, but the new owner has dug out the foundations of all these buildings. And if you drive down Montgomery Street today, you can look in his backyard and you'll see the stone foundations of these very early buildings. This is a building uh, of Rhinebeck uh, Bank. This building next to it was torn down at some point later on to build a second wing of the bank. I love the awnings. And of course, the postcard says, Dear Maddie, Aunt Martha and I arrived home right soon. Well, you could write anything on the back starting in this year of 1907. The new postcards would come out and they have a you know the divider back that you could write on. This I don't know what street this is. It says a winter scene in Rhinebeck. Um it was from 1906, um, and uh, it could be any one of our streets, but it looks beautiful. And a lot of the buildings are still there. And again, here's another postcard for your collection, Anne. And the back of the postcard says uh, 1906, and Mr. Robert Davis, Amenia, Duchess County, New York. Again, postman in Amenia knew where Robert Davis lived. You didn't have to address it any more than that. Here's Baker's Drugstore. It was there to 1906. Um, many buildings <clears throat> uh, were, were, businesses were in this building over the years. It is today part of Petite Bistro. It's the left side of the bistro. The right side was 2 East Market. The left side, this building was 8 East Market. Today, the address of the Petite Bistro, which occupies this the drugstore and the old cigar store next to it is now Fancy Restaurant, and its address is 2-8 East Market. Here's an interesting postcard as well from 1905. It says the Hamlin Building, Dry Goods and Groceries. And <clears throat> the top building says IOOF, and that was the International Order of Odd Fellows. It was a fraternal organization you met. I don't know what, how often they met, weekly, monthly. Um, and you would pay dues, and the dues would pay for your funeral. And they would meet and became good friends. And then when one of them died, you were guaranteed that your funeral was paid for, and you'd have a good crowd at your funeral because your fellow odd fellows would come. The second floor of the Hamlin building says... Um, uh, Rex, the Knights of Pythias, another fraternal organization. Later on, as I said, many stores occupied these buildings over the hundred years. The Rexall Drugstore was in there, the Skirmerhorn Drugstore, where the founder of the Rhinebeck Historical Society, DeWitt Grinnell, was a pharmacist. And today we know this building as the Village Pizza, formerly Shemi's Ice Cream Papa. So ma many, many businesses. We're going to move on to churches, but before we do, this is the high school um, in 1914, the postcard of the high school. And it's brilliant because the, for the first time, the only part we have left is the Brogan Center because the rest of it is burned down in 1939. But um, the back of the postcard, information, May 25th, 1914. Dear Jay, uh, Jay was Jessica Webb, First National Bank of Hudson. You walk into the bank, I have mail for Jessica Webb. Easy, no address is necessary. This is the place where I am to hold forth next year. She's going to teach at the school. A piece of history, finally, instead of having a great time. I am glad it's all settled, BFW. I don't know who those initials mean. Are you coming down for Decoration Day? which is, of course, Memorial Day today, two ball games. And this was May 25th. Decoration Day, of course, would be the following week. So I love this postcard because it's one of the very few that had a little bit of history of Rhinebeck on the back of it. And, of course, the street from the Brogan Center or the high school was the Church of the Messiah, the Catholic Church. Now, it's the second picture of the church. Right soon, May, 
um, this this postcard of the church was from uh, 1907. Now, um, what happened was John Jacob Astor and his friends were, were building their, their estate in Rhinebeck, and they this was an Episcopal church until the turn of the century in the 1800s. John Jacob Astor said, I don't want to worship in a little wooden church. I want to build a magnificent stone church. So this church became a Catholic church a couple of years after 1900. And in the meantime, here's a postcard of the church we know today, Church of the Messiah, the Episcopal Church, on Route 9, built by John Jacob Astor and his friends. It's full of a lot of stained glass windows, including, you can't see it here at the back, a Tiffany window. And we had a program last year there, and Father Richard gave a great talk of history, and uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff Christensen, Mike Frazier, and I all worked with him. We got pictures of all these beautiful stained glass windows. It's a great video, and if you haven't seen it already, you should take a look at it. You'll learn a lot about the Episcopal Church and about John Jacob Astor and the founding of his church. We'll keep moving through churches. This is, uh, we'll look for you, S, E, R, S, the Reformed Church on Route 9. Here's the cemetery. Here is a picture of the Baptist Church. Now, you know this today as the Ta Tarrapin Restaurant. The Baptist Church moved um, from this site to a brand new building on Route uh, 9 across the street from the hospital. And this postcard was in 1914. You notice the beautiful stained glass windows here and here and here. Well, they're not there today because they built a new church down by the hospital on Route 9 and made window frames to hold the stained glass windows. And they're in the new church. And if you go to have dinner in the restaurant today, you'll find plate glass windows replacing the stained glass windows. This is the Lutheran Church which was a couple of doors down from Thompson House, which was the parsonage before it became Thompson House Hospital, before it became an apartment building today. Now, here's a postcard from 1906 of the new Methodist Church on East Market Street. I'm calling it the new church because the old church was there originally, and in the winter of 1898, the old church boiler was working so hard. I think it was a February day. It was so cold that the boiler blew up, started a fire. The fire brigade came. They have cisterns. Some cisterns are still around the village. There was one in front of my house that we found when we were repaving uh, Mulberry Street, and they had to fill it in. They were used to get water. They'd bring the Pocahontas, the old pump engine, run by several men in, on each side of the engine, and the cistern was frozen. There was nothing they could do but let the church burn to the ground. So, of course, Rhinebeck the next year formed the Rhinebeck Water Company. And water lines and, and uh, fire hydrants were installed on Market Street, going all the way up to where today Rhinebeck um, Highway Department. Now, I'm putting this in, even though this is a picture from the 1950s. Uh, this is of Stone Church. Uh, it's up Route 9 on the Rhinebeck border. It was built very, very early on. And Mike Frazier gave a brilliant program inside the Church of the History of the Church with a tour of the cemetery over here. It's up on our website, and you should take a look at it. So the next four cards, I'm not even sure they're of Rhinebeck. They're bucolic scenes saying Rhinebeck, New York, a beautiful water. This could be the Rhinebeck Kill, it could be the Crystal Lake. Not sure. It's not specific. Here's another one of uh, people harvesting hay with, uh, with horses. This could have been just scenes that were hand painted or, or photographs taken somewhere else, again, to draw tourists to come up and stay in Rhinebeck and visit Rhinebeck. Here's another one. Here's sheep and a horse in some pasture somewhere, a scene near Rhinebeck. And the last one might be. Rhinebeck Kill, and this could be Mill Road heading down to the river. Again, it's not very clear at that, but that's what it is. Now, now, lastly, a scene around Bayback is one of my favorite postcards in the entire collection. 
I nearly upset a lamppost, Rhinebeck, New York. And here's a guy kissing a girl. Now, this could be the Esther Bridge. I'm not sure these lampposts were in there at the time. The point is, this was 1913. And it says, that's quite a scandalous postcard for 100 years ago. And the back of the postcard, which is 1913, Miss Rachel Brown, Fox Street, Poughkeepsie, from Grace's friend, Ernest Decker and Clarence Butler. Well, wow. I don't know if uh, Miss Rachel's mother got a hold of this postcard, but for 1913, I think this is quite a scandalous postcard, and it's a fun postcard from the collection. This, of course, is the monument. It's still in the cemetery of Gettysburg in the Rhinebeck Cemetery. Here's a postcard, um, confusing postcard. We talk with Herman Tejan, we talk with Michael Frazier. And Camp of the 15th Cavalry at Rhinebeck, September 21st, 1906. Stuyvesant Falls is quite north from here. So all that we could guess is that um, the 15th Cavalry, which existed from 1901 to 1921 and resurrected for World War II, they must have put on a demonstration at some field in Rhinebeck there are the soldiers on parade and the visitors enjoying the soldiers on parade. This is still here, Lake Sapasco, in a postcard from 1909. And this is a postcard um, of this Van Steenberg's mill. This would be Mill Street heading down to the river. And here's, of course, the mill pond and um, the waterfall would have been over there. We're going to take a look at Vice President Morton's estate. Oh, no, excuse me. We're going to take looks at Crystal Lake. Four early postcards of Crystal Lake. This is the first one. Some of these buildings might have been ice harvesting buildings because at the turn of the century, the lake froze, ice was harvested, stored in the buildings here. We have very old photographs of men working with big lifts lifting the blocks of ice into these storehouses. And of course, here's the falls. This probably is another building, uh, Crystal Lake from uh, the early 1900s. And it says, well, dear sister, how are you? Will you please answer soon? If I get, if you get this, I will write you a nice long letter. Uh, hope this finds you Enjoying yourself, loving your sister Flossie. Little picture, picture of Crystal Lake. Whoops, sorry. Is there someone rowing on Crystal Lake? And the last picture of Crystal Lake from 1904. These definitely are ice houses in 1904. August 25th, dear Charlie, I hope you're able to play tennis again. I'm enjoying it too. Also golf and bowling. We are having fine weather. I have just two more weeks to enjoy the outdoor life with love, Aunt Anne, I think, or Anna, can't tell. But 1904 early post got at Crystal Lake. Now we'll move on to Vice President Morton's estate, Ellerslie. Here's the beautiful gardens at Ellerslie and their greenhouse <coughs> down on the river. Is the bridge and the lake at Ellerslie. <clears throat> Here's a picture from 1903, I think, a postcard. Is the estate and looking out at the river, trusting you're all well. Here are more greenhouses at Ellerslie. There's a beautiful path heading down to the estate from the main road. The last picture is a beautiful picture it's Levi Morton's residence, right back New York. Unfortunately, it's no longer here, but it's probably the most important postcard in the collection because of what's written on the back. 1909, May 24th. Many thanks for your congratulations and good wishes, L.P. Morton. It was signed by the vice president. And it's written to a friend of his in Vermont. So I think most of you know that he was the vice president. He was a congressman for a couple of terms before he became vice president. 
governor of New York after that. But in the old adage of timing is everything, you may not know that. In 1880, Garfield asked Levi to be his running mate. And he was advised by his political advisors not to do it. And he turned it down. In 1888, Harrison asked him to be vice president. He ran and was elected vice president of the United States. Timing's everything. If in 1880, he says yes, Garfield gets assassinated, and forever Rhinebeck would be known as the home of the 21st president of the United States. So great postcard. Here's a picture of one of the earliest buildings in Rhinebeck, down near the river in Rhinecliff. The Hermann's house bit, bit, built in 1700. If you go into the post office today, you'll see the lintel from the doorway is right near the doorway to the post office inside. And it says uh, the, the Kip husband and wife's names are there engraved in it with 1700. Uh, this over the last 300 years suffered a lot of damage. Um, uh, you, you might notice what this building looks like. It looks like today's FDR post office because FDR used it as the model to build the 1939 post office. And here it is some years later. It's in, into ruins. The ruins were exacerbated by the fact that FDR used some of the stones from the ruins to help build the post office. And this is a great shot because this is a cannonball from a British gun that shot a hole in the building during the Revolutionary War. Today, it's almost all gone. There's just a few ruins of the oldest building in all of Rhinebeck. This, of course, is the Rhinecliff Hotel. It's had um, a considerable restoration, but it still looks like, uh, today, much like it did 100 years ago. So we're in Rhinecliff now, down by the river. We're going to walk around Rhinecliff for a while and then come back up to the village of Rhinebeck. So this is the hotel, looking much like it does today, except it's all almost brand newly built. This is the two Main Streets, Kelly Avenue. It's a really poor quality postcard. Oh, wrong way. And this is Charles Street, which is the Main Street of Rhinecliff. There was a post office here as well. There were three churches in Rhinecliff. One is the Methodist Episcopal Church. This has been converted to a private home. This is the Episcopal Church. It's up Grinnell Street past the Rhinecliff Hotel. It's just a pile of rocks. It's just a ruin. It's, it's just all been destroyed. But one church St. Joseph's Catholic Church is still there. It belongs to uh, Good Shepherd Parish and is still being used today by the church. This is Levi Morton's, I mean, a uh, gift to the village. It's, of course, the church way above it on a very slightly built area, which is much more built up today. Um, and it was given to the uh, village in memory of Levi Morton's daughter, Lena, who died in 1904. Here's a picture. Mike Frazier had to tell me what, what this was. A school in 1900 in Rhinecliff, and I did not know that there was a school, and this building is still in use today because this and this are mirrored on the other side, and these four wings are condos. And the message is, This is where my cousins go to school, had a nice time. We received the pictures. I think they were very nice. Tell Aunt Lil to clean my paintbrushes and send it with the rest of the bottle of something, I guess, uh, on the art shelf, Aunt Jean. So from your cousin Vera. So again, this was a very early postcard um, from early 1900, and it was no writing on the back of the postcard. This is the corner of Chatzel Avenue and 
uh, Ryan Beck and Ryan Cliff, Shots 11, it says, this was a, many, many stores in the last hundred years have existed here. And apparently it was a post office at one time because they mentioned it. But the post office today is up the hill next to the fire station. But this is all here. Like most of Rhinebeck, it exists today. This is an interesting picture. This is the Fink Mansion. All right, it's down on the river. It's today, it's called Windcliff, and it's a wreck. It's, it looks as bad as the Kip Beekman, her man's house. It's very, very destroyed. I don't know if anyone's going to ever buy it and try to fix it up. But it was built in 1853 as the country house of New York socialite Elizabeth Skirmahorn Jones. She did such a great job building the house and landscaping its 80 acres that, and this may be fact or not, the, the, the phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, was referring to her, Mrs. Elizabeth Skirmahorn Jones. She was related to the Astor family, was Edith Wharton's aunt. Edith mentions the house in several of her books. It was purchased by Andrew Fink, another New York City beer baron. He built a pipe running from the church, from the uh, mansion, down to the tennis courts so he could pump ice cold beer down to the people who were playing tennis. And the back of it is interesting because it's from 1919 and it was signed by Anna Fink, who must be a descendant of, from the Fink family, perhaps a daughter. Thinking of you, again, love, it's lovely up here. Love to all, uh, Brooklyn. Okay, another building on the river. This was Jacob Rupert's residence, Linwood. And um, it's quite beautiful. Uh, it was built, completed in 1884 for Jacob Rupert. We know him, Rupert Knickerbocker Beer. I think he owned the New York Knickerbocker basketball team at one time. Um, but he gifted the whole estate to the Sisters of St. Ursula, who built the Linwood Spiritual Center. And unfortunately, this very, very detailed and decorated house was was much too much money the sisters could not afford to maintain it and unfortunately it was torn down so i'm going to end now with a tour of the village of rhinebeck okay we're on route nine i'm going to try not to get you guys dizzy we're looking up towards the beekman arms traffic light this is the old Eagle Hotel, today's Soma Le Petit Bistro. And this is called the old telephone building. And we're gonna flip it. Now we're standing at telephone building. We're looking down to today's Amsterdam restaurant and on our way down to the Reformed Church. Looking much like it does today. The next one, we're on Chestnut Street. Okay, I have several Pictures of uh, views of Chestnut Street, all from around 1910. The first one, some brick buildings um, heading down the street. And all these brick buildings and all these other buildings are still there. Almost nothing on Chestnut Street has been torn down. Almost nothing. This building, of course, is still here today. It's the famous Benson's Frost House, who was a, a lawyer and F one of F FDR's best friends. Picture of the corner of Chestnut Street and Route 9. This was the Duchess Inn. I gave a talk about um, uh, the boarding houses of Rhinebeck at the turn of the century. This was the Duchess Inn. They had, they had room and board. It was a restaurant. And in 1939, when that old high school I showed you before burned down, they scrambled to find places to hold classes. And several grades of the elementary school were held in this building. And... I have pictures from 1945 by Frank Asher showing children playing in a playground out here. And of course, um, this was torn down at some point and this location contains Rugi's Automotive today. Here are some pictures of South Street, looking much like it does today. This is the edge of the Reformed Church, the cemetery, which contains 25 Revolutionary War veterans and many of the founding families like the Schultz family of Rhinebeck. All these buildings are still here. 
So are these buildings. This now is a picket fence in front of the Gables bed and breakfast, but um, it's still here. We move down a little bit to see more of these buildings still here. I love the horse and carriage. Our streets do not look like this today, even with all the hard work of the Tree Commission. Probably some of these were at Dutch Elms and died off. But look at the streets. All the streets you're seeing are dirt. And what do they have? Dirt and horse manure. What happens when it rains? All the trees get fed. Today, we've encased our sidewalks. We've got asphalt streets. And the trees have a hard time finding water to stay alive. So these were much, all these streets you're seeing are beautiful trees from the 1900s. Here are two views from East Market Street. Again, opposite directions, try not to get dizzy. This beautiful building was recently restored. This building is still here. You're coming up the hill from today's mobile station and around the bend past my house and on the way to Route 9 traffic light. We're going to flip 180. Again, look at this beautiful house down the hill to where the mobile station is. Both these houses are still here and in wonderful shape and up 308 on your way out of the village. Here's a picture of East Market Street. Unfortunately, you're standing like my house is to the right, but it's not in the picture. This is today's funeral parlor. This is Desa Haynes' former house and on its way down to the Methodist Church and Route 9 intersection of the Beekman Arms. Next one's looking up Market Street. Here's the Methodist Church. This house today is blue. Here we look up towards those beautiful red awnings on, to, on the cemetery. My house is somewhere here in the uh, trees, but you can't see it. Keep going. It was standing on the intersection. Very early picture. Um, all horse carriages. The um, Eagle Hotel was over here. There was a beer, Linden's beer parlor in there in 1900. It was a shoe store. Today it's Petit Bistro. This was, I think, a bicycle store. And then it became the, the Rhinebeck department store. And all these buildings are still here. Now we're flipping it. We've turned 180 again. And this is. Uh, um, 1906. We don't have Miller Philadelphia brick cream, but September 18, 1906, arrived here at noon, awful hot and dusty. John. Now, most of these buildings going back towards the Dra Beekman Arms and the traffic light are still here, except these were torn down to build the CBS parking lot, and these were torn down to build a Rhinebeck Bank parking lot. Other than that, all the buildings are still here from 1906. Now we're looking up, we're standing again under the Beekman Arms traffic light. We're looking up, here's the edge of the old Beekman Arms to the firehouse. All these buildings are still here and we're going up the hill towards the Thompson Mazzarella Park and today's library. We step back a little bit there's the Beekman Arms, and again, the street. This building, White's Corner, was torn down to build the gas station, and today is Foster's parking lot. We're standing again. This is the Petit Bistro, looking down at all the buildings. Now we're looking south on, on Route 9. Hub Garage was there. The old post office building, Rhinebeck Hall, was still there, as was the Beekman Arms. And now we're going to turn around and look up. <laughs> There's the white building torn down to build the gas station, Foster's parking lot. Again, today's Rhinebeck Hotel. And all these buildings and all these buildings, including the Star Institute, which is right here, is still here. Looking up Montgomery Street, October 3rd, 1907. There's two pictures of the Beekman Arms that I'll end with. Very old pictures from around 1900. Screened in porch, not looking much like it does today. And the last picture from uh, uh, Market Street, looking at Frawley's stage and Frawley's stagecoach. This, these took people up and down the hill from the train station to the center of the village. So I hope I haven't made too many mistakes. I'll stop to share. 
back into gallery view. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. David. I got stuck on the highway garage, but I'll, I'll delete that. Okay. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate your sharing a magnificent collection of postcards. They are all posted on the uh, Rhinebeck Historical Society website and also at rhinebeckhistory.org. If you go to the on the home page over to the right and click on uh, RHS postcards, you'll find them. The person that also needs to be deeply thanked is the person whose collection yep. these came from, and that is Scott Cruikshank. Uh, and I know you acknowledged him uh, early in your talk, David, but uh, thank you yet again, Scott, for all you did. We had uh, a number of comments, I know, and we'll turn it over to Jeff to go through those in a moment. But I had a, uh, a comment from Barbara Sweet, who reminded us that last night, uh, the Clinton Historical Society, uh, Barbara is with us here, right? And I think even Craig Marshall is, is with us this evening. Um, had a this was postcard. this was a meeting. Uh, the, this was a meeting of the Dutchess County Historical Society. I see. Okay. Last okay. night. I gotcha. Okay. And the other uh, comment that I had was uh, from Wendy uh, Wollerton. Wendy, are you still with us? If you could unmute yourself. You had a uh... yes, yes, I am. I'm sorry, I was coughing. No, that's um, okay. all right. I please, hope you're excuse okay. Me. Um, on the fairground shop, um, the aerial shot of the fairgrounds, those two rings were horse show rings. And in my generation, I guess in the 50s and then 60s, um, you jumped from the big ring through the entire outside course and galloped back into big ring again. The racetrack was just for cars, like Joey Chitwood, and for standard bread racing. But to my knowledge, there were no cars and no small rings, only horses. I have pictures from uh, Frank Asher and from others showing the stock car races. We have a program about uh, car racing uh, at the fairgrounds a couple of years ago. And we had it at the fairgrounds during the car show. And we had examples of stock cars. We had the drivers who drove the stock cars there. It was a joint effort with uh, the Red Historical Society at the time. And uh, um, like I said, I wish that they were still racing cars. And I have pictures of trotters, like the one in this four-sided postcard of trotters and uh, uh, horse races. I have a photograph of horse races that Frank Asher took. I also have right. my, of my father in law of the greenhouse of the, of the grandstand. My father-in-law, John Woolerton, raced in the late 50s um, stock cars at the racetrack there. And Art Wright, who built a lot of buildings in Rhinebeck, um, was the owner of the uh, car that my father-in-law raced in. And I wish I had the picture because Art Wright looks like James Dean. He's got his T-shirt rolled up with a cigarette in the sleeve, leaning very casually against the car. Like he's Joe Cool. He may be, and I think they raced all the time. Maybe every Saturday night. He may be in the video because we had some stock car racers, um, who, and then uh, we had a filmmaker who filmed all of the racers that were there, and we have old photographs of them given to us by uh, some of the Red Hook people that were put in the video. It's a great video done professionally by someone other than me, and it's it was it's brilliant. It's up on our website if you want to see a stock car racing at the uh, fairgrounds. You can watch that video. And I believe there's a picture of art, right, that I had scanned. Yeah. 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 Um, and we also had many of the programs that were actually saved by Vernon and Mary Sipperly, uh, who used to hang out at the stock car races. They loved them. And uh, they donated a lot of material to the Historical Society from, from their collections. Jeff, do we have any other uh, comments? Anybody else with their uh, hands up? Uh, I um, I see that Herb Sweet has his hand up. Herb, if you want to unmute your mic and go ahead, and if you want to turn your camera on, you can do that too. 
if you have a comment to Herb, Herb Sweet. Maybe he stepped away. Perhaps. While we're waiting for Herb, um, as a comment I wanted to make, I uh, one of the postcards, there was a nice postcard of the uh, what was called the um, the Fink Mansion, which most of the people around here know as the Windcliffe Estate, uh, built for Alice Shemmerhorn Jones in 1860. Uh, architect was George Veitch, who I believe was the architect of the um, what's now the um, Good Shepherd Church. Um, and uh, later became known as the Fink, Fink Mansion because uh, it was bought by Andrew Fink, a brewer in New York City. Three generations of Finks lived in that mansion. Um, the second generation was August Fink, who was a great oh, friend of friend. Jacob Rupert, yeah, I will. Because, uh, Jake Rupert, oh. who lived in the adjacent um, uh, estate. Jake Rupert uh, had the Rupert estate, built Yankee Stadium, brought Babe Ruth over. Uh, and they were good friends because they were both from Germany and they were brewers. The uh, now August's uh, son, the third generation of Finks to live in that estate, uh, Theodore Fink, his wife, Anna Wolf is probably the Anna Fink who wrote that postcard. Oh, good. I, I couldn't figure out. I don't have a genealogy chart of the Fink family and didn't, didn't know where she. Yeah, that was there. probably Anna Wolf, the wife of uh, Theodore uh, Fink, the third generation Fink, and the last generation to live in the uh, Wincliffe mansion, which was a 32 acre estate. I see we have Herb now. So, Herb, why don't you go on ahead? Yeah, you know, I had some problem getting on muted for a while. I was particularly uh, uh, bemused by the, the, the postcards not having complete addresses. And uh, just recently, I was looking through some family papers. And my mother, this is back in the early 30s, had received a letter. And she was, she was living in Cincinnati. But it was addressed to her name, street, and beneath that, it just said city. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a, a, a couple of years, year, several years ago, uh, Richard and Barbara Cunningham lived here. And uh, Barbara Cunningham was the, he was, he was a, a mayor for a period of time. And she was the town clerk. And their house burned down. It was a big fire and they had to rebuild the house. The next day, the mailman delivered their mail to Rhinebeck Town Hall because he knew that she was the town clerk and that's where he could get her, her mail. So I said, a hundred years and nothing's happened. You know, uh -huh. it's still the same. It's a small <laughs> town and they can find you. My you wife had told I'm, I'm sorry. I, no, go wife, ahead, Herb. My wife had told me uh, uh, when, when she was living up in the Finger Lakes area and her brother was in the Air Force, he'd call home, collect, and uh, the operator would, would jump in and say, well, I'm sorry, Stuart, your mother's not home. But well, you want me to try grandma's house? <laughs> <laughs> the I, good I, old I, days. I hope that you get a lot more history on the back of the postcards, other than it's beautiful up here, you know, see when we get home. Um, but, it, but it was a postcard, you know. Uh, my, my wife said, what were you looking for? I don't know. Uh, you think Bob, uh, Bob's going to ask Mary to marry him? And she said, no, you idiot. That's a postcard. She would write that in a letter. The mailman, everybody in the post office could read the postcard and know what was going on. So that's why these are like tweets. That's all they are. You know, uh, great, great time up here. Playing tennis, swimming. See when we get home. And, uh, I see that uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Abers Press, you have your mic unmuted. Did you want to uh, make a comment, Elizabeth? Um, I will say, am I muted? Uh, unmuted? Uh, we, can, we can hear you. We can, we can hear you. We can't oh, see you. Thank you. you. No, I'm just, um, you know, baffled. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, wonderful. Um, so regarding the Linwood estate, so that's not the original home. That's there now. So no, the, is, was... the the Linwood building that David had a postcard of, as he yes. explained, when the property turned over to 
sisters, the sisters of St. Ursula, Ursula, it was very difficult for them to maintain such a large building. It needed a lot of work. Oh. And what happened, as I understand it, is that it was at, it was, I don't know who made the arrangements, but the local and actually other fire departments from the area used it as a practice site. They burned the building down. Oh. Uh, and it became, it, it was the, right now you have a Duchess Fire Center that's located near Duchess Community College where they have exercises for firemen to uh -huh. train them on how to handle going into a burning building. Uh -huh. um, and fires were much more common then and were often deadly to firemen. Uh, uh -huh. And this was an opportunity to do something uh, that was helpful to the community, not very helpful to those of us interested in historic preservation. Yeah. But they, but there were a lot of uh, that postcard was was made a lot earlier than when the building uh, was turned over to the sisters, and it was okay. in horrible condition. Okay. Nevertheless, that must have been lost. about. Um, uh, I don't know. Nineteen hundred. Uh, no, it was well after. It was when uh, Rupert Chalk had passed away. I don't yes. know if uh, Nancy Kelly is, Nancy or Art is still with us. Yeah, I mean, she may remember the date. Yeah. I, th I That's think okay. it was. Yeah, my grandparents, you know, were the, um, the sh chef and groundsman there at Linwood. Ah. Well, not Linwood, actually, the original home. From 1905, when my father was born nearby there. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. um, for me, yes, it's very Ebers. Ebers, right. right. Yeah, it was. I see, uh, I see, Sue, that you have your hand raised. Would you like to uh, unmute yourself and go on ahead? Yes. Hi. This has been fascinating. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I was wondering if you had uh, an idea of um, what percentage of Rhinebeck Village and Rhinecliffe is still the original from maybe the 1900. Can you give an estimate on that? A pretty, we're very lucky that a pretty good percentage of Rhinebeck, even before all of our historic preservation laws went into effect, is still here. We haven't had a lot of them. As I said, that, that picture of Market Street um, East Market Street, it would all be intact were it not for the two holes that were knocked down. I think it was four buildings and four or five buildings to build a bank parking lot and the CVS parking lot. Um, and other than that, most of the homes, buildings, businesses that were here 100 years ago are still here. We had a program, again, a couple of years ago, the Rhinebeck that lost, that, that was lost and uh, uh, I did that with uh, uh, Don McTiernan, did that with me, and we showed that many of the buildings, it, it's, uh, I would say, 80, 90%. I don't know if Michael agrees with me or not, but we're, we're, we're very lucky. We're mm -hmm. very lucky. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Uh, and a suggestion, uh, if anyone else wants to mention something and they don't know how to raise their hand, if just unmute your mic and uh, we'll see that and call on you. Um, apart from that, Michael, I don't have any other. Um, just just chats. one comment about a lot of the postcards. And actually, it was also true of mail for U U.S. mail for many years, is that you see not one, but two postmarks on m many of the uh, postcards. And that's not because somebody in the post office was confused were delayed sending them out. What happened to mail in those days was that it was postmarked in the outgoing post office, and then it was postmarked in the receiving post office. Hmm. And you had a very good idea from those postmarks how long it took to go from uh, one place to another. Uh, yeah, and it's... Uh, yeah, that's it's it's a great way to uh, I I often find that very fascinating with yeah. correspondence from uh, this period. Yeah. June, I see you've unmuted. Uh, do you want to go ahead and uh, ask something or make a comment, June? Yes, um, 
I, I think the presentation was great and I'd love to see these old postcards. And I don't mean to be critical, but I noted uh, that you that Mike or that um, David mentioned that some buildings were torn down to make way for the CVS pharmacy. Um, there was an IGA supermarket there before the CVS pharmacy was there. So it was not torn down. They were not torn down for the CVS pharmacy. They were torn down for it. Was, it was the Empire Market in mm -hmm. the 1950s. And I scanned photographs by, taken by Frank Asher. And there, mm -hmm. there are marks on the buildings. Come, future home of the Empire Market. Mm -hmm. You can see that today's uh, Abbas Flaffel is where it, it that that starts it. And then Samuel's Candy Shop ends mm -hmm. it. And the buildings between those two what were torn down in, I think it was 1954. And then they built the Empire Market. And of course, like everything else, it went IGA and then CBS. Many, many stores have taken, even in my 20 years here, I've seen two or three stores occupying the same building. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that, that it wasn't torn down for the, for the CVS right. pharmacy. <clears throat> just trying to put it in the it reference to, to people. It happens to, to be the today. CVS pharmacy now, but... So if if there are uh, no other comments, uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, with us this evening and this program, should you have anyone else ask you about it, uh, will be posted online as a YouTube video. Uh, just uh, use the title Rhinebeck in the 1900s or Rhinebeck Historical Society YouTube videos. Uh, and David, uh, as we close, uh, thank you very much. And I also want to mention before we close, uh, especially since she is here with us this evening, Bonnie Wood will be our speaker a month from now on February 23rd. And she will be speaking about uh, Professor DeGarmo and the DeGarmo Institute. Uh, and we'll go back uh, a little bit further uh, in history before uh, the Rhinebeck that David was talking about. So Bonnie, we're looking forward to your talk at the Star Library, 7 p.m., uh, February 23rd. And David, uh, thanks much. And what yeah, I'd like to do you, is if thank David- you, Mike, uh, Thank you Go very ahead, much, Bonnie. Mike. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, he lived from uh, 1838 to 1919. And he was not only in Rhinebeck, but in many places in Dutchess County. So it's uh, he's a Renaissance man. So there's a lot to tell, and uh, it'll be an exciting evening coming up in February. Yeah, we're all looking forward to it. David, uh, if you and Jeff could stay on, and everybody else, uh, thank you, and good night. <laughs>